We can smell the coffee beans. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I just talked about lip sync along with this thing. So, so in any case, this was a uh, Liberty Mutual commercial that was done for me. Nice to meet everybody. I'm Chuck Jones. Most of the time, I'll talk about how coffee is processed, how coffee is brewed, how it's extracted, how it's stored, how it's ground, all that stuff. But I thought that this was kind of a different group of people here. And quite frankly, uh, nobody's ever comfortable talking in front of people, especially when there's video cameras and cell phones and all that other stuff that can pick up stuff forever. <laughs> I'm usually outspoken privately. <laughs> so um, let me see here. So I'm Chuck Jones, and uh, I'm a coffee roaster. And uh, just like all of you, I mean, I started off like all of you. Actually, I consider myself still like all of you. I this place is nice. It's co-working space. We actually thought about my dad and I thought about starting our own co-working space, and and uh, it beats working out of your car. It beats working out of your garage. I kind of wish I could live here. So <laughs> nice place. Um, I'm going to talk about focus in business. I'm going to talk about tools, and I'm going to talk about human beings in business. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, how I found my roots in coffee, and took a flight on my business without a flight plan. And I fumbled and stumbled to find my tools, and I was essentially saved by the human element on many levels. It was 1993, and the job market was dreary. And the job market was dreary, sorry about that. And the job market was dreary, and, um, and I suggested my dad, I don't know if uh, any of you know, but from the background, uh, my mother's from Guatemala, and we, we have a family coffee farm down in Guatemala that we, we spent most of our time growing up as kids going back and forth to Guatemala. And, um, and my dad and I used to always roast on a cookie sheet in the barbecue, and that's what the video from Liberty Mutual mentions, and my grandpa and I used to roast on a popcorn popper. So, so I was kind of, you know, associated with roasting coffee, but I never imagined that it would actually be, you know, my destiny. I always thought it was just a place that was amazing to go to growing up as a child. And when I was getting out of college, you know, my brother and I were looking at a kind of a dreary job market, and, and I uh, suggested to my dad that maybe we buy some coffee for my grandfather, and we buy, um, at the time, the market was, was below the cost of production. It was very depressed uh, a commodities market. And my grandfather had a bumper crop, so there was a bit of a surplus of coffee. So we went ahead and bought um, a, a box, a container, for $20,000, a box. Does anybody have an idea what a box is? It's, it's 250 of these bags. These bags are 150 pounds each. So that comes out to 20 tons. 20 tons of coffee. Can anyone guess? Wow. Wow. How many cups of coffee is 20 tons? <laughs> 1.9 1. million. Wow. 1.9 million cups of coffee in 20 tons. That's also the quantity that they use for a green coffee contract that we use in the trading commodities futures. This is the part of the system that the industry created as a barrier to the market for the little guys like me. So the only difference between the pork bellies or the barrels of oil is that we actually take physical delivery of these commodities. And most traders will dump the contracts before they expire and hopefully a gain, but not always. And those traders are usually drinking Folgers or some other crappy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so my brother and I did this with my dad's money without a plan. We didn't do this just once. We actually did it twice. And it even gets worse because the first time that we did it, it cost us $20,000 in 1993. The second time we did it, the same container, or the next container, cost us $80,000. Oh. Again, without a plan. So that lemonade stand, I don't know if you read the bio, but, but, but it's about my lemonade stand in San Marino, the corner of Wilson and El Molino, that I dominated the market. <laughs> <laughs> there was a few weak, feeble attempts across the street by some of my neighbors, but I took them out. <laughs> so, um, so I was someplace where I didn't belong after spending $100,000 on almost 4 million cups of coffee without a plan. I was playing in the sandbox with the big boys in the commodities market, playing with my dad's money. My dad and my mom are here, right here. 
to dad and mom. <laughs> and, uh, and I still had no plan. I was playing around with these big guys in the commodities market, and that lemonade stand was looking better and better. So with 40 tons of coffee, <laughs> no plan, and my first debt with Bank of Jones, my brother and I moved home and we assembled our old bunk beds in the guest room and used the card table as a partner's desk. My vision was blurred, my menu was bloated as we chased these markets down dark alleys, and I squeezed another $20,000 out of the Bank of Jones, and I bought a roasting machine. We had dumped 40, bags of these, 40 of these bags from the first container to help finance the second container. And I swore at that point that we weren't gonna ever discount our coffee again. And I figured if I got this roasting machine, then I can add value to the coffee and also bring a, a, a fresh roasted product to the Pasadena market. Because I learned from, from studies that we were the first and only coffee roaster in Pasadena in 1994. I rented a small space from my friend's ice cream parlor. Anybody remember Soda Jerks down the street on Fair Oaks? Yeah. So I rented the front window, it was 10 by 10 feet. I paid a dollar a square foot. So I got the front window for $100 a month. And I, and I climbed up on the roof and I sawed a hole in the roof and I put the vent out the roof with a residential venting ducting system. <laughs> and, um, and I just did it. I started roasting coffee. At that time, my target market Anyone who drinks coffee or anyone who knows someone <laughs> who drinks coffee. So there's a lot of smoke screens in the business that, uh, that don't really help clear the skies, especially when you have blurry vision like I did. More barriers to market. The famous free equipment when you buy into a program. How many of you know about the free equipment? You know, like the free router with your ISP, or the free cell phone with your wireless provider, the free equipment. Well, guess what? There's no free lunch. And the seasoned professionals know that too. And they're the golden eggs. Those are the accounts that I've built the best long-standing relationships with, personally and financially. My business is really three businesses, just so you understand. Is I have the retail business, where we retail coffee to in, in consumers. We have the wholesale business, where we actually set up accounts with wholesale accounts like Julian and Green Street and Caltech, and those are wholesale accounts. And then we also have a manufacturing business and distribution business where we take the green coffee, which is in these bags, and roast it, and then repackage it. And we also distribute this coffee along with non-coffee uh, allied products like syrups and, 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 uh, and filters and, and, and brewing equipment and stuff like that. So, Essentially, they're all three little small businesses, but they're three distinct businesses wrapped up in one. And the reason I bring this up is because while I'm talking, I'm gonna be talking about clients, both end user consumers and wholesale customers. So the clients who ask about the free equipment don't exist on our client list any longer. That's usually because they went out of business owing us money. I call them the Groupons of the coffee business. <laughs> The other thing that made it difficult was the elusive decision maker. You never know who they are. I spent hours crafting deals with prospects and to find out where the DM was. I would even ask them, are you the decision maker? Point blank, are you the, oh yeah, I'm the decision maker. And then when it came down to it, there was another whole group of people that I had to talk to. It wasn't always the executive chef. It could have been a food committee making arbitrary decisions for a private club. <coughs> It could be the last person you would expect. It could be the person with the mop who might be the only person in the whole building that grinds their own beans at home. At one point, I felt if the roasting machine wasn't running, then we weren't making money. That seems logical, right? So I started picking up jobs by toll roasting, private labeling, co-packing. We'll call that, we'll call that plain wrap coffee. <laughs> This eventually became my primary business. We were moving thousands of pounds and tens of thousands of dollars every month. We capitalized further with $150,000 of packaging equipment and bigger roasting equipment. Still a very young company and I was losing $300 a month and I wasn't gonna be able to make that up on volume. Oh, and by the way, still no plan. This was seven years after we started the business. This was the year 2000. 
no plan. When I raised my prices 50 cents per pound to try to break even, just at least break even, all the plain wrap business walked out the door. So what did I do wrong? I asked one of my good friends, Steve Sable, one of my advisors, best buddies. Wait, did I do this slide already? No. Oh, okay, so that's basically what I just said. <laughs> so I asked a good friend, Steve Sable, I said, you know, what did I do wrong? And he said, Chuck, you became a commodity in the supply chain. You are building their brand, not your own brand. Ultimately, you're gonna find your value in your own brand. So at that point, we should have been bankrupt. I should have been looking for a job. Thanks to the Bank of Jones, I wasn't. <laughs> and I quickly downsized and I reorganized as if I had a choice. Another come to Jesus moment that I had about our brand was at the Getty Center. We were awarded a contract for the Getty Center. It was huge. <laughs> <laughs> the Getty doesn't showcase brands, and I, and I appreciate that, because it's all about the art. They don't want brands flashing around while people are trying to take in the scenes and the gardens. It's an awesome place. So as our relationship developed at the Getty Center, I realized that their equipment maintenance program was, 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 was extensive, and expensive for us. And so. It was cost prohibitive, and they weren't doing much for our brand, and I didn't expect them to. So we gracefully gave notice and walked away from that business, even though it was lots and lots of money. Another interesting smoke screen is the glorious convenience of the K-Cup. Amazing. Who would have thought? We've been selling coffee to Keurig Green Mountain Company for over 20 years. My mom and I used to go around to their retail stores. They had 12 retail stores in New England. My mom and I would go from each retail store and talk about our farm and our social programs and our environmental impact programs and Guatemala education programs. And then after that, they shut down the retail stores and went crazy in wholesale. And eventually they, they had a hostile takeover company called Keurig and they started producing these little capsules. Cure Green Mountain was the master of the 80-20 rule. While all the other roasting companies at the time were focusing on cause coffees, certifications, Rainforest Alliance, Shea Grown Coffee, uh, Organic, Fair Trade, while they were all focused on that, on that, Cure Green Mountain was focusing on the unrecognized and the unmet needs that the consumer didn't even know that they had. And that was convenience and consistency in both the house and the office. Now, Cure Green Mountain is selling convenience with a 72% market share of the single serve market. Last year, a private equity firm from Germany bought them for $14 billion. $14 billion. Unless you're in the food business, you probably didn't even know about it. That's the same company that earlier this year bought Pete's, Intelligentsia, and Stumptown. So currently, all those companies <coughs> are on foreign soil. One of my friends from the coffee business posted during the consolidation, I woke up this morning and my and the Germans bought my kids. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so I just want to know, uh, raise your hands if you do not make coffee at home. Raise your hands if you do not make coffee at home. Okay, so that would be safe to say that most of you make coffee at home. And can somebody give me an idea of how much you pay per pound? How much you pay per pound? Fifteen ninety-five. Okay. Anybody else? Eighteen. Five ninety. Eighteen. Five ninety. Eighteen. Huh? Eighteen. I know that price. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> well, can anybody guess how much a pound of coffee is in these little capsules? Three. It's like six seventy-five dollars. What? Would you believe? 30 to $50 per pound. And that doesn't include the environmental impact costs of the little plastic capsules that you throw away afterwards. 30 to $50 a pound. And the consumer didn't even know that this was a need that they hadn't had met. The consumer was taken by surprise. Green Mountain wasn't. 14 billion. Crazy, okay. So 10 years into the business, I started. To, I finally decided to start building my bag of tools. 10 years into the business. Some tools were new, 
but most were sharpened and recycled. And the vision and mission statements are the important tools that always require sharpening. Everyone tries to hide from them because the vision and mission statement forces us to take inventory and communicate. And that's a lot harder than it sounds. The brand is a tool. That was a new one for me too. But this was the easiest because if it's not good for the brand, then it wasn't good for me. And this is also about the time that we decided to change the name of the company from Pasadena Coffee Roasters. Anybody ever remember the Jetsons thing? Ah, yeah. Pasadena Coffee Roasters to Jones Coffee Roasters. Understanding how to read the financial statements was also a new and very helpful tool for me. Again, <laughs> <laughs> again year 10, okay? So they were always there, but they felt a little bit obligatory and rather more, than, more obligatory than helpful. And as I grew up, I found myself using industry, industry operating ratios like, like second nature, like offices need 20, 20 employees or more to, 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 to supply, rent should be under 8% gross, manufacturing <coughs> margins should be at least 30%, distribution margins should be at least 15%, the free equipment should be paid off within nine months. So the financials just started coming naturally, and, and, but it took 10 years. Thank you, Banker Jones. <laughs> the biggest eye opener though, when it came to tools and building my bag of tools was, was the advisors. We had an amazing team of rock star advisors. Oh, I missed that slide there. And they were underutilized. Oh. When did I start listening and asking the questions of my advisors? That was when my dad casually suggested that it was time for me to sustain my innovations. <laughs> this is when I started asking the hard questions. I was excited about my, my new bag of tools. I was talking to my parents, dear friend Joe Cologne. I told him about all my plans with excitement, and he said, Chuck, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're gonna be going. He also said that the second store is always the hardest store. And by the way, the new store that we have at Romans is our second attempt at a second store. We had a store in West Hollywood for three years. Does anybody know that we had a store in West Hollywood? No. Two people. Thank you. <laughs> You never know how much money you're losing from a project until the project actually ends. I lost about $300,000 on that project when it was all said and done. Again, a blurry, urban, a blurry vision with all the best intentions and no plan. So time to regroup again. This was when small roasters started moving into the LA market from Chicago and Portland and Northern California. We re-examined our brand strength and pulled back to our hometown in Pasadena. And this, this was a good move. I took self inventory again, and I realized everything I needed was right there in front of me. It was hard for me to read the writing on the wall when my back was up against it. So now enters the saving human element, the inspiration. Our employees were dedicated for, more, for the better or for worse. We've lost very few employees and the management team has been believing in me for the last 20 years. Thanks, Rafi. Rafi's over there roasting, I mean, uh, making drinks, and he's been roasting coffee for us for about 20 years as well. <sighs> Can't believe they stuck with me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my family and friends also believed in me. They encouraged me to stay true to my core beliefs. Our clients like Caltech and JPL and or I'm sorry, Caltech and Green Street and Julian, they believed in me, they never second guessed me and they gave me the leash to do my job and provide a quality coffee program versus just a quality coffee. There's a difference. The human element has been the endangered species in the world today. Jones is a Wi-Fi free zone, not a free Wi-Fi zone. So we're never gonna please people who are using hotspots in our stores but the path of least resistance in our culture at Jones is to read a book, engage with a new or old friend, play a board game, or enjoy some music. We're not anti-Wi-Fi, we're actually pro-people. We can brave the one-star reviews for not having Wi-Fi, but that's not our gig. Our new target market appreciates the chance to unplug a little bit. The other day when I was talking to a new barista at our store, 
I explained her job as this. I was holding up a single roasted bean and told her this bean has been touched by almost 50 human hands before it found its way to your grinder. You're the last step before handing that cup of coffee to the consumer. You're the ambassador for all those passionate workers who pick the cherries, those who process and mill the seeds, sorting through each one looking for any visual imperfections, exporting, shipping, importing, storing. Then when Rafi roasts it, Socorro packages it, and finally to you, you'll grind it and brew this cup for the customer. They'll pour it into their body. No pressure. <laughs> but you're representing all of those human hands. It's the human element on our farm. This is our farm. It's the human element on our farm, at our roastery, in our stores, and within every product that eventually saved me. Being present and aware it cannot be automated, it cannot be streamlined. I see this as our competitive advantage as small business entrepreneurs heading into the future. These life experiences have given me a new respect for what I see as a slow and steady development of our business, sharpening my vision, clearing the skies. I have my bag of tools, I'm ready to rock. I look in the mirror and around me, I find seasoned professionalism has snuck up on me from nowhere. I have a little bit of gray, and a little ache, but more importantly, I have the passion to sustain my innovations. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chuck, for that um, passionate and inspiring story about how you guys created something out of just a shot in the dark, really. In the, in the Bank of Jones, we appreciate it because everyone here in Pasadena that has had Jones coffee before is the beneficiary of that experience. So thank you for taking that risk, to, and that inspires us to take risks for ourselves and our businesses. We're going to open up to Q&A right now. Uh, John's going to walk around with the mic. If you've got the question, raise your hand. We'll, we'll see if we can get an answer. Um, if we don't have a chance to, to answer your question, Chuck, will you stick around for a little bit so we can just hang out? Very good. And uh, remember, there's coffee in the back that, uh, Rafi is his name? Rafael. Rafael, thank you. He's actually uh, um, making specialty drinks too, so if you guys are interested, please take advantage. Uh, save your comments for offline, questions only. My first question is, where's the Bank of Jones located? <laughs> <laughs> Bank of Jones is shut down. Just saying that. I was told 10 years ago, no more. Hi, I'm, I'm over here. Um, you mentioned that you have now the freedom to innovate. What do you consider your greatest innovation in, in the business of coffee? You know, I really think that, that, that it is the human element. And I think it's focusing on the human element. I think that uh, I, I, I have a, a girlfriend now, and, 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 and we've got about two years now, and it's been amazing. I think it's really my first girlfriend, even though I have two gorgeous children. But my girlfriend taught me that you need to be present. And I really still feel that no matter what we do, even if it's coffee or widgets or whatever, that you need to be present with that product because it's never going to be automated. And it's that 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 passion or that 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 um, emotion that you tap into. That was another thing that Steve Sable told me was when they were growing Green Mountain to $14 billion, every single time they went and did a campaign, it tapped somebody's emotion. And he says, when you tap somebody's emotion, then you're there for life. I mean, there's a really slim chance that you're gonna lose them. And there's there's nothing a lot more emotional than coffee. So I'm just glad that we picked coffee versus bottled water or polystyrene cups or something like that. <laughs> but I think it's the emotional um, um, uh, human aspect that, 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 that's the innovation. Don't, don't you think? I think I mean, it's great, yeah. It, it, different from many of the presentations we see, which focus on the technical. Oh. Well, yeah, you can see from earlier that the technical <laughs> 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 The next question is over here. Hi. I, I want to ask you a practical question. For those of us who don't have the Bank of Jones, how do you make, how would you suggest that you make the leap? You have the bag of tools now. How do you make the leap from the lemonade stand to the first storefront when you don't have a Bank of Jones? 
I think that's a great question. So, so about 10 years ago was when one of my advisors, it might have been Steve, I don't remember, but, but one of my advisors told me, he says, you know, you need to find a banker. You need to, you need to, uh, and he didn't know that I had, I didn't have a choice, but um, he says, it's time for you to start building a relationship with a banker. And he said, don't look for a bank, look for a banker. Because the banker's going to look out for your best interest and the banker may change banks, but they're going to be your partner. And I and this guy walked in, and, and he was my bank. And I and I and I feel like the bank doesn't want to know how much money you're going to make in your projections. They don't want to know what rate of increase you're going to be doing it. What they want to know is they want to know that you know what you're doing well enough that when you do your projections, you're as close as possible to what you're saying that you're going to do. And having a track record, I think, helps, but also. Showing them, like, if you're going to say, okay, well, we're going to have 15% growth over the next three years, but you're actually 40% growth, that's cool. But that might not be what the bank wants to hear. They might want to hear that you know what you're doing so well. You know your cost of goods, you know your expenses, you know your right of raise, you know everything so well that you're going to hit it on point. So that means that when you go back to them again, because they give you a little teaser. So, so what I would recommend is, is, is and it's going to start off with a credit card, unfortunately. But if you show the bank that this is what you did with $20,000 on a credit card and you were able to pay off that credit card and turn around and, and, and actually make 10,000 off that 20, then that's the beginning of the track record where the bank says, okay, well, there's your, there's your track record. What do your projections look like? Does that help? Thank you. So I think this is a good follow-up to that question. Um, aside from the banker and the bank of Jones, from the human aspect, when you described your story, you mentioned a number of stumbles and a number of times when you actually had losses. How do you work through those and get past all of that so that you do wind up being successful? You know, um, I don't know, my parents. I mean, and I'm not talking about financially. You know, I'm talking about trying to regroup and figure out like what what kind of raw assets we have because frankly you know we weren't we weren't uh, collateralized really with Bank of Jones so so that was like dumping those 40 bags at a loss it's kind of like okay well what do we got what can we get rid of what do we need to do how do we get the water out of the boat right um, there were a lot of times where I just wanted to give up I was just like you know this is awful but at that point, you know, at one point I had one kid, at another point I had another kid, and I was just kind of like looking at these kids, like, I can't do that. You know, that's like that's like the, the ultimate selfishness right there. If I'm just gonna end up living in my parents' garage with these kids, that doesn't work. That's not how you become a good role model. And then, and then the, 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 the next part was then when, when my employees started having kids, like Rafi, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this isn't just a project anymore, we're actually, building families here inside of this little teeny business. So I think that that was what inspired me to try to hang on were my parents and my kids, and then my employees' kids. So, okay, did I answer the question? Kind of? <laughs> well, from the, from the emotional, personal, but also backing from the business, the tools, the people that you surrounded yourself with. It was a great answer, but I also meant like from the business side, human aspect as well. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I sold off whatever we could just to keep moving to the next step, you know, basically. And it, like when, when the plane wrap business went down, it, it, you know, the, the, we had to get rid of the equipment as quickly as possible. We took losses, you know, we, we, there was, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of, you know, two steps back, one step forward. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and speaking to the human element, um, the question is, what did you do in order to gain the right talent? Right, because that seems to be a very difficult thing today. And how did you create your culture that they stayed with you for 20 years? Maybe from being a barista to now, they've been with you 20 years and their families are surviving because of the business you've created. It's a great question. So I'm always battling with that cultural question about what we would do, but, but it kind of is like, it is what it is. I was asking my girlfriend, I was asking, well, what, what, what should I wear tomorrow? She's like, just be yourself. Like, okay, well, you know, in, in the culture and the business, it's the same way. It's kind of like, well, we are what we are. You know, my parents sat down at the dinner room table every single night with all five of us kids around the table, and, and, and that was it. That was the nucleus of the family. 
And it's that modeling that was what allowed us to do the same thing naturally inside the culture of the business. And the other people would ask me, they said, well, how can you treat all your employees like family? And so I, I, can't, I can't afford to pay them like employees. 